it's kind of interesting because growing up as a child, um, I, I went to church, you know, with my mother. My father was not active in church with our family. I went to church with my mother as a young child, would fall asleep in her lap. Um, as a young adult, went to church. And living in her household, that was what the expectation was, so we did it. And then going into the military, going overseas, you know, kind of went my own direction and did some things that I know was not right. I could be in the club with friends and just feel out of place. Um, just environments that just what weren't really weren't me, things that I knew better of. Um, I suspect that all the bad relationships, because there's been a few, um, bad decisions that I've made, I know that that was the grace of God that was looking out for me. Um, I had praying mother, I had a praying grandmother, I had praying aunts, uncles, and just knowing that there comes a point in your life that you need it for yourself, that you're not relying on somebody else praying for you and looking out for you, that it's like, this is what I want for me, a deeper understanding, a deeper feeling, uh, uh, my own personal relationship. Um, I prayed for an amazing man, and at the age of 37, I found him, and guess what? He was a Christian man. Um, so we can make bad decisions. We can, we can come back from some of the things that we've done. None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect, but God forgives. He loves us, and as long as we put him first and seek him, he's going to be there for us may not always be when we think it should happen. Trust me, I was 25, 26 saying, why can't I have this great relationship that I've seen in other people? Why don't I have any children? Um, well, guess what, Dawn? Because you were not spiritually ready for all of that. And um, when you get it, I'm telling you, it's an amazing feeling. It's the, you feel like, I felt like when Mason was born, how did I survive all these years without him? But at the same time, when I became a Christian, for myself, I was like, how did I survive all these years without Jesus in my life? This is one of the videos we're going to be showing at Faith Fest this year. Along with several other testimonies from, from several different people. And we're going to be introducing these to you on Sundays. Uh, normally they're going to be after our countdown as we get ready to begin our worship, but today, man, Dawn's message really goes well with what we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. If you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and be looking with me to Luke chapter 15. We're in the story of the prodigal son. And we've been using this to go through a series entitled Throwing the Switch. And what we've been talking about, what we mean by throwing the switch is that moment where we're finally able to see something that we haven't been able to see before and it absolutely changes everything. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Th these are those moments where we typically say something like, man, the light just came on for me. We're finally able to see it and it changes everything, especially in our relationship with God. But we're talking about... We're talking about change. We're talking about waking up spiritually. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at a book that was written several years ago by a guy by the name of Kyle Eidelman, and he gives us some ingredients on how we can make the light come on and stay on. And, and some of the things that we've talked about from the very beginning, first of all, number one, there has to be a sudden awakening. And this is really where our story picks up in Luke chapter 15. When, when we talk about a sudden awakening, we're talking about how our eyes are finally open to something that we've previously been missing. Right? We're, we're finally able to see that there is a problem in our life. And, and that's what we see with the prodigal son. Right? Remember we said from the beginning there were two sons. And the younger of the sons, he went to his father and, and he basically says, Dad, I can't wait for you to die. He says, I want my inheritance now. And his dad gives him 
the inheritance. And he takes that money and he gets his things together and he goes off to this distant country where he spends all of that inheritance on wild living, the Bible says. And this is where things start to go south for the younger son. Now we don't know how long he was there, but I can tell you, we said this in the beginning, life apart from the father, it eventually begins to fall apart. And some of you have experienced that. That's what Dawn was talking about in the video. Life begins to fall apart when you try and do life without the Father. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we started talking about the book of Jeremiah. And remember how I was talking about how the, the people of Israel, they had strayed away from God. And God is trying to bring them back. And He's sending prophets to bring them back. And He's telling them, listen, just repent. Turn back to Me. If you don't, I'm going to punish you. If you don't, I'm going to send you into exile. And they would not listen. But as you get towards the end of the book of Jeremiah, guess what? It's not just about the people of Israel. It's not just about God's chosen people. This goes for everyone. I mean, God starts calling out people. He's like, and, and you Ammonites, and you Egyptians, and you Babylonians who I'm going to use to bring this punishment upon Israel. But listen, if you don't change, if you don't cut out the wickedness, if you don't start living for me, he says, I am going to punish you. Things are going to begin to fall apart and every one of those things began to happen. And so life apart from the father, it, it starts falling apart for the, for the prodigal sons. He runs out of money. A famine strikes. There's very little food. And, and so he starts looking around trying to find some sort of job so that he can support himself. And the only thing available was a job feeding pigs. And as we say to a Jewish individual, this would have been the worst job you could have because pigs were unclean. But you see, things were just, they were going south. And it even gets to the point where, man, finally he hits rock bottom. No one will give him any food. And so here he is in this pig pen, and he's starving to death, and he gets to the point to where he begins to desire the food, the slop that he is feeding the pigs. And all of a sudden, there is this sudden awakening. He begins to look around and, and say to himself, man, how did I get to this point? This is not the way life was supposed to turn out for me. And, and you know, many times this is how it happens with us. There's a famine. There's something bad that happens to us. And all of a sudden, our, our eyes are open and we begin to realize that there is a problem in our life. The prodigal, at that point, it says he came to his senses. In other words, he began to see things as they really were. But where did he go from there? Well, that comes to our, our second ingredient, and that is brutal honesty. Right? He was, he was honest with himself. He took a good look in the mirror, and he began to speak to himself about himself. And man, this is a hard conversation to have. He said to himself. He's having this conversation in the pig pen. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. That moment where in your mind you're talking to yourself going, man, why did I say that? Slate, why did you do that? How did you get here? And so here he is. He's having this very real conversation. And, and the first thing that he says is this. He says, I'm starving to death. In other words, he's, he's honest. He's honest about where, he, where he's at. He's not sugarcoating anything. He's not saying, oh man, things are going to be alright. Things aren't as bad as they seem. I, I'm sure things are, are going to turn around. No, he says, I am starving to death. And then he's, he's very honest about something else here. He says, I have sinned. That's huge. That is so hard for us to do, right? But he says, I have sinned. He doesn't try and put it off on somebody else. He doesn't say, well, if, if you only knew the parents that I had. Well, if you only knew my spouse. You know, if you only knew the boss that I was working with. And let me tell you something. It's very tempting to try and take the weight of our sin and place it on someone else. And he just comes out and he says, I'm honest. I've, I've sinned. 
I've sinned against heaven, I've sinned against God, and I have sinned against my Father. I mean, He is brutally honest. And then He takes action. And as I said last week, this may be the most important thing about the entire story because it says in verse 18, so he got up. Now, if you take out those last three words, he got up. Let me tell you something, you don't have a story at all. I mean, if all he does is have this awakening and realizes, man, I've got a problem in my life. And then he's brutally honest with himself. You know, I am the problem. I have sin. But then he doesn't take action. He just procrastinates. And let me tell you something, if we're not careful... We can take comfort in our procrastination. And what I mean by that is, is we can take comfort in the fact that, hey, one of these days, I, I've got a plan. You know, one of these days I'm going to do something about it. One of these days I am, I am going to change. And, and so it's one of these days. And so we kick back and say, look, hey, I've got a game plan. It's, it's going to happen. It's just not going to happen right now. And days turn into years and... Many times there's no change. And let me tell you something, when, when we have a God that is trying to do something in our life and trying to do something in our heart and it doesn't line up with what He's trying to do, let me tell you something, it's going to get really frustrating and exhausting. In fact, let me, let me word it like this for those of you who are Christians here today. It is really exhausting being a hypocrite. I'm telling you. When, when your life does not line up with what God wants you to do and you're just wearing a mask on Sunday and Wednesday and, and you're not you know, working and, and taking action to, to try and get to where you need to be in a relationship with God, I'm going to tell you, it's going to wear you out. Eventually it will break you. Sudden awakening, brutal honesty, and then immediate action. In other words, there's, there's something that, that we, we need to do. And we look back at the story of the prodigal, and, and he does something. It's not a, a, a huge game plan, a complicated plan. Um, he just says, I've, I've sinned against you know, heaven, and I have sinned against my father. And he says, you know what, I'm going to get up, and I'm, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to tell my dad that. And so he gets up, and he goes home. And here's where we pick up. How is the father going to respond? How's he going to respond to the son coming back home? Now I can tell you, those who are listening, those who are in the audience there in the first century, they already know how the, the father is going to handle this, right? I mean, they're already thinking in their mind, man, the father is going to lower the boom. I mean, he is going to let the son have it. He is going to tell him, let me tell you something, young man. You're going to pay back every last dime of that inheritance that you spent. I mean, the father's just going to lower the boom. They know this in their mind. And then Jesus says this, verse 20. He says, but while he, that's the prodigal, that's the younger son, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. Isn't that awesome? And then you, you keep on reading. Here's the, here's the younger son, and, and he's been practicing, right, all the way home what he's going to say to the father. He's been going over it over and over in his, in his head. And so he comes up on the father, and he says, Father, he says, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father's not even listening, if you really look at the text, right? Because in the very next verse, he just says, quick. He says, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. He says, let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And don't you know, the people there in the first century, man, they're scratching their heads and they're going, what just happened? 
Are, are, are you kidding me? This is not the way this is supposed to play out. I mean, the father should let him have it. I mean, the son, he was disrespectful. He was cold-hearted. I mean, here he is. He tells his father, basically, you know, I wish you would go ahead and die so I can get my money now. And Jesus shocks the crowd by saying, and when he returns, he's met with open arms. He's met with mercy and he's met with grace and he's, he's met with unconditional love. I mean, just, just go back to verse 20 and look at a couple of these phrases. I mean, they, they're just they're mind-boggling, especially when we apply this to our Heavenly Father because that's what Jesus is trying to show them here. He says, while He was still a long way off. In other words, the prodigal was a long way from where he needed to be spiritually. He was a long way from where His Heavenly Father wanted Him to be. But while he was a long way off, the father didn't sit there with his arms crossed waiting for him to come home. It says, man, he runs out to meet his son. Now here's what you need to understand about this phrase. During this day and time, children ran. Servants ran. But a, a, a sophisticated father, a refined father, would not run. And yet he runs to meet his son. And then as you keep reading in, in verse 21, it says, man, he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And, and the word kiss there literally means he showered him with kisses. And what's so big about that, that phrase there is you're talking about, think about this, and we've talked about this already, you're talking about a kid that stinks. He's been working in a pig pen. He hasn't had any money to, to bathe and to take a bath. I mean, he stinks. He's been traveling this long distance home. You, you talk about B.O. and stench and smelling like a, a pig, but the father doesn't care. He runs out to meet him, and he embraces him, and he showers him with kisses. And this is so important because so oftentimes there are people who say, well, you know, I've got to get my act together first before I come to God. I've got to clean my act up first. I've got, to, I've got to get my life right. But here's the thing. The Father is not waiting for us to get our act together before He accepts us back. The Father says, look, you just come as you are. And I think for a lot of people during this day and time, and I'm praying that there are some that may be here today that this will throw a switch. I mean, for them in the first century, I mean, hearing this, this, this would have been mind-boggling for them because their idea of the Father was one that was harsh. A dictator, a cosmic cop man who was waiting for them to make a mistake so that he could pounce on them and squish them like a bug. And Jesus says, no, you got it all wrong. He says, actually, he says, our heavenly Father, he's, he's a loving Father. And I think for many of them, the light came on. But this was so foreign to them. I mean, even... After, even like after 200 years of, of Christianity, the Romans looked at, at Christianity as, as basically being something very close to atheism. Because the Christian God didn't line up with all these foreign false gods that they had heard about in all these different religions. Because, I mean, if, if, if this was, you know, their God, then guess what? At this point, you would have been paying the price. You would have been paying back the debt. And then, maybe, just maybe, you could come back and be a servant. And Jesus says, that's not the one true God. God is a loving Father and His arms are open and people are going, wow. 
I just want you to know this morning that God loves you. I don't care where you are. I don't care what you've done. God's waiting with open arms. He, he loves you. And He wants you to come home. Now, some of you may be looking at this story and you go, well, that was, that was a great story. That's the end, not the end of the story. There's also another character that we kind of touched on at the very beginning of this series. But then we kind of left it at that. And, and now we're going to see him coming back and playing a major role. In fact, I believe he's probably the main character in this story. We just ain't got to him yet. Remember, I told you there were two sons. There was an older son and, and a younger son. And the older son, he comes in from the field one day. I mean, he's been working for the father. He never left. He's obeying his father. He's checking off all the boxes. He's, he's doing everything just right. And he comes in from the field and he hears music and, and dancing and he smells food and he, and he grabs one of the servants and he says, man, he says, what's going on? And the servant says, you haven't heard? He says, your brother has come home and we're celebrating. And in verse 21, he says the, the older brother was so angry he wouldn't even go in. And his father comes out and he says, well, What's wrong? I, I, I don't understand. Your, your brother who's been lost, he's, he's been found. What, what, what's wrong? And, and listen to what the older brother says, verses 29 through 30. But he answered his father. He says, look, and here's the disrespect in that. He says, look, he says, all these years I've been slaving for you. Never disobeyed your orders. In other words, look at all that I've done and look at all that I haven't done. I've been slaving for you. And he says, yet yeah, you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father, says, he says, you've always, you're always with me. And, and everything I have is yours. He says, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours, he was dead and, and now he's alive again and he was lost and, and he's, he's found. You see, really, this is the reason why Jesus tells a story about the prodigal son. You see, many times what we miss in this lesson, is there's actually two lost sons here. Tim Keller put it this way. He says one son was lost in his badness and the other son was lost in his goodness. But he couldn't see it. He hadn't had an awakening. He, he hadn't been honest with himself. And you say, well, well, why would Jesus tell this, this part of the story? We'll go back to the first two verses. And I mean, this sets the context for everything. You see the crowd that Jesus is telling this story to. He says, now the tax collectors and sinners, they were gathering around Jesus. They, they wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. There's, there's the younger brother. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, okay, you're talking about the religious people of this day. They muttered, and, and the word that's used there means they were complaining. This man welcomes sinners, and, and he eats with them. There's the older brother. Both were lost. One lost in his badness, the other lost in, in his goodness. Maybe some of you have never been lost in the distant country. I mean, you grew up in the church. Dawn talked about that in her, in her video. 
And you grew up in the father's house. Maybe your, your dad was a song leader like Wayne, or maybe your, your dad was an elder in the church, and your mom, man, she was a Sunday school teacher, and, and she was always serving around the building. And man, every time the doors were open, you were there. But desperately lost. How do we know if we're the older brother? I think this story gives us some indicators. First of all, there's an unwillingness to celebrate another's light coming home. Brother and sister comes home. Someone comes to Jesus and we're not excited about it at all. In fact, we're, we're offended. Don't you know who they are? Don't you know what they've done? And if that happens, it means that we've forgotten about God's grace and mercy for us. We've forgotten how lost we were. And so, with the grace and the mercy that God extends to us, shouldn't we extend that mercy and grace to others and celebrate it? But then also another indicator is there's this confidence in our own goodness instead of the Father's grace. I mean, look back and, and notice the, the words that the older brother uses. He says, all these years I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders. What are you saying? What I'm saying is I deserve this. I mean, I'm, I'm a good person. I've done all these things. I've stayed away from all these things. I deserve. You have the older brother who is I deserve, and you have the younger brother who says, I'm not worthy. Kind of reminds you of a story. Another story that Jesus tells about a Pharisee and a tax collector. You have the Pharisee over here who goes to the temple, and he's looking up at heaven, and he's saying, God, I am so thankful I am not like that guy. I mean, God, you know I give, and God, you know how faithful I am, and, and God, you know. And then over here, you've got this tax collector who won't even look up, and he's beating his breast, and he's saying, I am so unworthy. And Jesus says, it's that guy who went home justified instead of the other. But Slate, look at what all I've done. I mean, I've always come to church. I've always given. I've always served. Why are you so excited about this guy? Why, why are you so excited about her? Why are you, why are you paying her so much attention? Why, why, why are you reaching out to them? I've been here. I've been faithful the entire time. It happens right here in the Father's house. But then the third indicator is whining. What were they whining about? They were whining that Jesus was hanging out with sinners. They were whining because, you know what, things were changing. They, all, they weren't always, you know, like it, like it used to be. I mean, why, why, why can't we go back to the days where good church-going people who knew how to dress and who knew how to sing and, and, and families were strong and, and, and kids were well-behaved. I mean, why can't we go back to those days? You know, get, why, why have we got to enter these days where families are messed up and we've got people who are addicted to things and they're struggling in their marriage? They whined amongst themselves. Why? Because they were more focused on themselves than they were concerned about those who were lost and truly needed the help of Jesus. And so as we conclude this series, 
what this has caused me to do is kind of cause me to ask the question, which son am I? Am I the younger son in the distant country? Am I the younger son who finally gets to the point, who's broken, and he says, Dad, I'm ready to come home. Will you forgive me? Or am I the older son who's standing there with crossed arms saying, I deserve this. Why are you celebrating them? And life is all about me. We're going to go ahead and, and extend the invitation. This is the end of the series. And some of you may be that right now you need to take some action. Some of you have told me throughout this series, man, this has been eye-opening for me. That's a sudden awakening. For some of you, that also means that, hey, you've been honest with yourself. You, you've been talking to yourself, and you've been saying, this has been eye-opening because I now see I, my life is not where it needs to be spiritually. But have you taken action? Have you done anything about it? Have you restored your relationship with God? Have you finally made the decision, I'm going to give my life to God? There may be some of you here today who, who need to come to Jesus believing that He is the Son of God, trusting Him with your life, putting on Christ in baptism, having your sins completely washed away through His blood, not anything that you do, but our forgiveness comes from Him and His sacrifice. And some of you need to do that today. But whatever the case may be, um, I, I want to encourage you to come today. I, I guarantee you we've had some people come uh, throughout this series and, and they've been met with open arms. I guarantee you, I don't care who you are, even if you're visiting with us today, you won't be sitting on this pew by yourself. Somebody will come put their arm around you and they'll probably look at you and, and say, man, I've been there too. I love you. And so whatever the case may be, if you need to respond today, don't, don't delay, don't procrastinate. Give your life to Jesus today as together we stand and sing.